Four years ago, we reported cosmologists puzzling over a serious discrepancy between two independent measurements of our cosmic expansion rate. This Hubble tension has been dubbed the biggest crisis in cosmology. But now there's a new problem, the S8 tension. Yet again, two independent measurements of a fundamental cosmological parameter do not agree. This time, it's not the expansion rate that is at issue, but the growth of structures within the universe. And if shown to be real, it may cause us to rethink the very origin and fate of the cosmos. Ancient people, they looked at the sky, they saw stars, and they saw stars not evenly distributed. And they imagined many nice stories about the distribution of stars. Now, we are trying to ask similar questions about the distribution of galaxies. Structure in the universe is everything from galaxies to clusters of galaxies to, you know, what they call the cosmic web, large scale uh, features that connect clusters and galaxies together with large underdense regions called voids between them. Everything in the universe is in motion and as the universe expands from the Big Bang, uh, structures grow. Gravity pulls matter together. Um, the universe starts off very smooth without very many structures in it. All of the matter in the universe is very evenly distributed and as time evolves all of that matter clumps together through gravity gravity pulls structures together. So if you have a very small perturbation in that distribution of matter at early times, gravity will tend to make it grow. It will grow into you know, an extreme non-linear structure like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies that we see around us at present day. According to our current knowledge, if we want to explain where this structure comes from, we have to go back to the very early universe when the universe was very small and very hot. So now that makes uh, the issue of the origin of structure doubly interesting because the uh, origin of things that we observe is tied to what happened in the very early universe. That's the question of origin of space and time. So it's this confluence of basic philosophical questions and hard data. In the early universe, it's almost completely smooth, almost featureless, just with tiny little ripples in it. And we see those ripples when we look at the cosmic microwave background. Then as time goes on and the universe expands, the ripples become deeper in a sense. So that's what we talk about. When we say structure grows, that's what we mean is that that is becoming less smooth, less uniform as time goes on. So we know how the universe is expanding and we think we know what it's made of, dark matter and dark energy mostly. And depending on how the universe expands also determines how quickly the structure grows with time. So in the current model, Lambda CDM it's called, for Cosmological Constant Lambda, and CDM stands for Cold Dark Matter, that predicts how unsmooth or inhomogeneous the universe will be today if we understand those components in the expansion. Now the problem is, when we actually measure how lumpy the universe is in the nearby universe, how lumpy the structures are, they seem a little bit smoother than what you would predict if you look at the cosmic microwave background and extrapolate that to the present day. This model fits the data that we have from the microwave background quite well. And uh, at first sight, it also fits the distribution of galaxies quite well. But then if you look at much higher precision, and we've only been able to get this precision in the last couple of years, then there seem to be slight deviations. So the predictions don't quite match. So if we hold on to the predictions for the microwave background, then we see slightly less structure on, in the distribution of galaxies than we would have expected. And this is my understanding of what this uh, sigma-8 tension is where eight corresponds to a particular length scale in the universe and 
sigma is a mathematical symbol for, for structure. S8 is a combination of some of the key parameters in cosmology. They really only need six numbers to describe the universe. And S8 involves a combination of two of them. One of them is the density of matter, usually written as omega matter. It's to the 0.5 power, but that's not too important. Uh, the other one is a measure called sigma 8. Uh, and those two things together combine to give you S8. Now, sigma 8, imagine doing the following experiment. Take a sphere of a radius of 8 megaparsecs and then go around to different places in the universe and measure the density, the average density within such a sphere. You repeat this operation many different times, moving the sphere to different locations. And at the end of the operation, instead of looking at the mean density, you look at the spread or the standard deviation of densities within a sphere of such a size. That's in practice how this inhomogeneity is measured. We can also look at how much structure there is from more local observations by looking at galaxies around us. We can do this in two key methods. One of them is called weak lensing, and one of them is called retrospace distortions. So weak lensing, every image of a galaxy is slightly distorted, and it's distorted because along the line of sight from that galaxy to us, the photons from that galaxy have been distorted by the matter along that line of sight. And that's distorted the shape of galaxies in a very small way, but we can measure it statistically if we've got enough galaxies. And from that, we can infer how much matter there had to be along the line of sight and how clumpy it had to be in order to give that particular distortion of shapes in the galaxy. And then retrospace distortions is a way of actually measuring the velocities of the galaxies around us. And those velocities tell us how rapidly structure is forming. And so what we find when we do this comparison through a couple of these different methods, weak lensing and cosmic flows, is that the universe appears to actually be smoother than what we would have predicted from extrapolating from the fluctuations seen way, way back in the early universe at the time of the cosmic microwave background, when the universe was only 300,000 years old, to the present day when the universe is close to 14 billion years old. If the standard model of cosmology is correct, all of these measurements should agree, but it's becoming increasingly clear that they don't. Now the level of the discrepancy differs from technique to technique, but they all go the same way. And that each individual method maybe differs by about three standard deviations or three sigma, as we say. If you put them all together, I would say the discrepancy might be something more like four sigma, although there's some disagreement about that, depending on who you talk to. Um, and that's a pretty strong level of disagreement by astronomy standards. Other fields, maybe particle physicists, have a, have a higher threshold for what they consider a statistically significant effect, maybe five sigma. But in astronomy, four sigma is something you really have to take seriously. It could still be a measurement error, um, but people have spent a lot of time looking at the measurements. They've not found it yet. There are many different techniques that all seem to be giving lower values of this amount of structure in the universe compared to the cosmic microwave background, uh, that it would be strange if it was a statistical anomaly. Um, there are theories that say there could be something happening not on the very largest scales in the universe, but perhaps on the smallest scales. So some of these measurements, they look at structure as it's grown on very small scales compared to very large scales, whereas the theory tends to work better on the very large scales. So there could be some scale difference in terms of understanding um, what's going on. And so that might not kill the standard model of cosmology. It might just mean that we need to understand better how structure is forming within that model, which is still interesting, but perhaps not quite as exciting as showing that the standard model of cosmology is wrong. So any one individual technique or any one individual experiment or survey or set of observations might be an error. Uh, but what really makes me think that, that something is going on here is that we see consistent agreement amongst totally different techniques, which are all going in the same direction. It's that agreement between different methods, I think, that suggests that systematic errors, maybe unknown systematic errors, are not affecting 
any of them in particular because otherwise they would be bouncing all over the place. But they're all systematically shifted towards lower values of this S8 parameter than what you would expect from the cosmic microwave background. The story of the S8 tension closely resembles that of the Hubble tension, where measurements of the expansion rate of the universe, given by supernova data, give a significantly different value than that given by the cosmic microwave background. In both cases, it looks like measurements that we gain from looking at close-by things give different results than if we look at the microwave background and we uh, use our theoretical prejudice. One possibility, of course, is that changes may come in the low redshift nearby universe because that is the location and the time where dark energy starts to take over. And so it's possible that we don't understand everything about dark energy and it may be doing something in the nearby universe that hasn't been predicted. In my opinion, the um, Sigma-8 tension is more interesting than the Hubble tension because it is less easy to explain it with uh, systematic uncertainties. So what could be causing this S8 uh, problem? Nobody to date has found a convincing modification of the standard picture of cosmology that both solves the Hubble tension, another one of the well-known problems in cosmology uh, today, and this S8 tension at the same time. In fact, it's even worse than that because the proposed solutions for the Hubble tension actually make the S8 tension worse in the sense that they predict an even higher level of inhomogeneity coming from the cosmic microwave background, which makes the discrepancy with the lower level of inhomogeneity in the nearby universe even, even more of a problem. So I am, have no idea, to be honest, what the solution to this is. Cosmologists think the universe is dominated by dark energy and dark matter, two concepts that physicists still do not have a good handle on. In particular, it's assumed that dark energy is a constant throughout time and space. This is denoted by the Greek letter lambda. But what if lambda was not a constant? What if it changed over time? The link to dark energy is a tricky one, though, because if it's just a pure cosmological constant, then I don't think it can explain either of these two tensions. In, indeed, the Standard model starts from the cosmic microwave background, assumes a cosmological constant, and extrapolates that to the present day. But there is a possibility that the cause of the acceleration of the universe may not be either a pure con cosmological constant, it may be some form of time-varying dark energy, or it may be indeed a modification of gravity, a deviation from general relativity in some other way. So it could be that these two problems are giving us some deep insight, which hasn't been solved yet, into what, <laughs> what uh, the nature of this cosmological constant or dark energy really is. While there is some dispute, the majority view of cosmologists is that the universe underwent a rapid period of expansion called inflation. This is believed to have ended, at least in our local universe, 13.8 billion years ago. Assuming there was another period of accelerated expansion, after inflation and before the effects of lambda kick in, is known as early dark energy, and it's a popular candidate for resolving the Hubble tension. So, postulating that there's this extra thing in the universe, an extra energy density or process, causing this accelerated expansion is something you really don't want to have to do unless you have to. But we do know, uh, or at least there is good evidence, that there were other periods of accelerated expansion in the universe. One happened around the time of the Big Bang, and it was um, it's the best theory we have for it is called inflation, and it was a period of accelerated expansion uh, which actually uh, solves a number of problems uh, that we see in the local universe, particularly explaining why patches uh, in the universe that shouldn't have been causally connected actually were, because inflation drives it this way. There is another uh, period of accelerated expansion in the universe, that's called dark energy, it happens at low redshift. And so maybe given these two, 
that we have very good observational evidence for, postulating that there was a third as well is not too, uh, too bad. One idea that we're particularly excited about and will be the subject of a future film on this channel is a quantum gravity proposal known as causal set theory. In 1987, Raphael Sorkin used this to predict the existence of dark energy more than a decade before it was discovered. Causal sets proposes there are atoms of space and time. Fluctuations in these space-time atoms cause the value of lambda to change, and this might explain why there are several periods of accelerated expansion. So in fact, in, in uh, Sorkin's uh, causal set theory, the effect of cosmological constant, uh, it varies in time and it becomes positive and negative. So the time average is zero, but uh, in terms of how structures grow in the universe, it's not the time average that's, impor that's important, but it's the overall evolution. Causal set theory radically revises the standard model of cosmology because it gives us a notion of time before the Big Bang. And if lambda changes over time, it could become negative, reversing the accelerated expansion that we see today, possibly causing it to re-collapse. We often hear as fact that the universe will never re-collapse. And uh, this is not necessarily the case. So uh, the future of the universe could be more interesting. But fitting both the Hubble and S8 tension is a struggle for any candidate theory. I don't know whether it would fit either of the tensions, but it has a chance of fitting the sigma-8 tension, and it's certainly something that is very interesting to analyze. Some models of early dark energy assume a hypothetical field known as the axion, and this is where problems often arise. That field, um, as it evolves, and eventually decays away. It has to go away to sort of make contact with observations today of the Hubble parameter. So as it goes away in cosmology, it's not enough to just talk about the background evolution of the um, field, but it has one has to consider also the perturbations of that field, okay? And because undulations, quantum fluctuations will Quantum mechanics turns on, and you will see these perturbations. The minute that you turn on these perturbations, it will actually make the SA tension worse. In the early versions of early dark energy, what is usually called upon is a field called the axion. Using ingredients from string theory, Stefan Alexander and his collaborators may have found a way around these problems. If you only have the axion field, um, it doesn't usually decay away. It needs to sort of drain away. It's like, you know, imagine you have some cosmic sink <laughs> that drains away the axion field. So we didn't have a big enough cosmic sink to drain away this axion. But now, by just simply realizing that in string theory, you see the axion is not alone. The axion is actually part of another, of a, say, a more complete scalar field. Um, and we usually call this thing a, um, a chiral um, field. And in another way, another way of saying this is that I can imagine having a mother scalar field, and that scale that mother scalar field comprises of an axion and another field called the dilaton. So they come together. You can't have one without the other. They're part of the same um, field, this mother field. And um, so, if you accept this, then what happens is that you have an axion and a dilaton. They both have their respective potentials. And what happens is that the axion and the dilettons interact with each other in, in a way that's completely determined by the equations of string theory. So you don't have any flexibility, you don't have much flexibility. But if you look at the way the axion and the dilaton um, interact, here's, a, here's how the story goes now with this new version of early dark energy. The axion still contributes to early dark energy, but then the dilaton very quickly creates a sink that drains the axion very rapidly to the point where it has no observable effect when you turn the perturbations on. So what that, what that ends up doing, it actually 
this allows the perturbations of the axions to make the SA tension even worse. But now when you actually study how the axion now evolves in the later universe, it contributes a tiny, tiny amount, like a 1% contribution to the dark matter, which then fixes the SA tension. There are, of course, many ideas that theorists will need to ponder to try and solve these tensions. But for every exciting anomaly that leads to new physics, there are many more that turn out to be dead ends and measurement errors. What we need is more data. The future looks great for this. Um, I'm leading a weak lensing team as part of a ground-based survey called Unions, which we think will give us the best measurement of this in the near future. And then going forward, it's extremely exciting because a number of very large, very expensive, both space-based and ground-based operations are gonna measure this with exquisite precision. Foremost amongst them is the Euclid satellite. Euclid is a survey mission. It's going to observe 15,000 square degrees, so about a third of the visible um, area, the, the area that you can actually look at. And it's going to do both weak lensing and galaxy clustering measurements. So Euclid will collect, through this technique, will collect images of a billion galaxies, 10 times more than what we can measure today from the ground. So the, the statistical errors will be much smaller, and more importantly, because it's based in space, and because we don't have to worry, as you do on the ground with the blurring of the atmosphere, uh, the Euclid space-based measurements should be much more robust to systematic effects. So that'll be truly a spectacular achievement if it all works as it's supposed to. Once it's launched, uh, then there's a period of commissioning uh, while they check out the instrument and the telescope and check everything is working as it should be. Then there's a, um, a phase of early science data where really it's still testing the instrument, but it's also testing that the galaxies we want to observe have the right density, uh, they are behaving as we expected, we get the right resolution, we get the right sensitivity. Once that's complete, uh, we start on the mission proper. Um, we expect the first science results using roughly the first year's data. It's a six and a half year mission. Uh, but the first batch of science papers will come out with the first year data, and you can expect those um, in around two and a half years' time. Euclid's satellite is scheduled to launch this July, and it'll take observations for about six years, and at the end of that, it will be the definitive weak lensing data set that should really nail this and tell us whether this discrepancy is, is true or disappears entirely. Are we on the eve of a revolution in cosmology? Or will we be left with the disappointment that there's nothing interesting to see? We asked our astronomers to bet on which path the future will take. Not a gambling person. I don't like gambling. Um, I would probably think a little bit of both. 50-50 odds? Yeah. I would definitely go that it's a real effect and there's new physics.